Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel and this is the Hour of the Raven, your channel for everything Ravenloft, RPG, Dungeons and Dragons and horror. Today we are going to uncover the past and secrets of Vlad Drakov, the tyrant warlord and dark lord of Falkovnia. Before we start, I would like to remind everyone that this video will be focused on the Falkovnia from the classic Ravenloft setting and will consider the events and characters that existed in the domain prior to the reboot of Von Richt and Guy to Ravenloft. At the end of my video coverage of the Falkovnia from the classic Ravenloft setting, I will make some considerations and comparisons with the new version of Falkovnia in the Von Richt and Guy to Ravenloft. Unfortunately, Dark Lord Vlad Drakov of the classic Falkovnia was not included in the new book Von Richt and Guy to Ravenloft. And instead, a new version of the character, Dark Lord Vladeska Drakov, was inserted in his place. If you are interested in the classic Dark Lord stats and update for Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition, I recommend you take a look at the version of Vlad Drakov created by Mist Factor Press in the DM's Guild. Mist Factor Press is on a project to update all Dark Lords and domains to the 5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons, and create a complete book of Dark Lords. They are also making available Dark Lords and domains in specific books, releasing a new Dark Lord every Monday, and the book about Vlad Rakov and Falkovnia is already available in the DM's Guild. Finally, before we get started, I would like to warn you in advance that Falkovnia is a brutal realm of human horrors, where the very evil and cruel nature of humanity is exposed in the light of Ravenloft's dark fantasy and gothic horror. Are you ready? Betrayed by an infiltrated spy, our encounter with the rebels of the Freemen of Falkovnia is interrupted by the invasion of Drakov's soldiers, and we are captured, imprisoned and taken to the central prison. We remain in a dark cell for a while, but soon we are dragged to a torture room. Unspeakable agonies await us in the hands of Igor Drakov, as he tries to extract from us the secrets from the insurgent rebels. Amidst the pain and suffering, the minister of Central Prison treats us with disturbing intimacy and claim that if we do not share what we know, we will have the honor of attending the dinner with the glorious King Führer Vlad Drakov. To torment us and mess with our psyche, he begins to recount his father's grotesque exploits as a scare tactic. How Ah, so you dare question my orders and authority. What did you call me in your speech? A despot, a tyrant, a bloody thirsty barbarian. Now you cry and beg for mercy. Pain and suffering have the power to purify the minds of the weak. You won't have any forgiveness. But you have time to reflect on your mistakes as you tickle down the stake. But Play your instrument. Let the cries of the damned mix with the notes of your fiddle. For I'm starving tonight. Vlad Drakov is the Dark Lord of Falkovnia, a cruel tyrant and warlord who rules his kingdom with an iron fist. Vlad Drakov's character adapts to Dungeons and Dragons the horrors of a cruel medieval warlord adapting themes of human brutality and cruelty to a gothic setting, and also blending modern elements of 20th century fascist and totalitarian regimes. Contrary to what some recent sources at Wizards of the Coast claim, Vlad Drakov was not redundant with the character of Count Strahd, taking a completely different approach from the Dark Lord of Barovia. Vlad Drakov's initial inspiration is the historical figure of Vlad Tepes, who inspired Bram Stoker in the creation of his character Dracula. Vlad Drakov is named after Vlad Tepes and is also a medieval lord, 
who has an habit of impaling his enemies on stakes. Despite this obvious reference to Vlad Depths, the correlation with the historical figure does not go deep, and the character is an amalgamation of the worst characteristic of conquering warlords, with elements of totalitarian and fascist regimes of the 20th century. Vlad Rakov is human and is currently 93 years old, but appears to be no more than 50, and is still agile and vigorous. Rakov is over 6 feet tall, has broad shoulders, and the physique of a soldier in his prime. His skin is mirrored by sun exposure and numerous scars, and his face has a hawkish nose, grey blue eyes, and shoulder length hair and a long beard, streaked with grey. He always dresses in military uniforms or armor, usually in dark tones, with a belt and his pins that hold his cloak depicting the emblem of the hawk. Drakov carries himself with authority, arrogance and confidence, and anyone who watches him for a short time know they are facing a dangerous man, an experienced and disciplined warrior, who does not tolerate mistakes or failures from those around him. Drakov was a 16 level fighter in the third edition of Ravenloft. Few in the entire lands of the mists could challenge him in combat, which is made even more difficult by his experience, wit and brutality as a fighter. Radrakov is well equipped with an ornate full armor, a tower shield, and sword and bows of excellent quality, all enchanted to become even more powerful and lethal. He also uses gauntlets that give him the strength of an ogre, a ring of free movement, boots of speed, and numerous protective amulets. His competence as a warrior and military leader, and his ambition to become a great conqueror, powerful, respected and feared by all, became the target of his torments and curse by the Dark Powers. Despite commanding the lands of Falkovnia with an iron fist, all of Drakov's attempts to conquest foreign lands have resulted in resounding failures, and these inexplicable defeats are unbearable torments to Drakov. Vlad Drakov is the king Führer of Falkovnia, having conquered his throne by force. He ruled his lands from the imposing Drakipetri castle through a rigid military hierarchy and an oppressive and totalitarian regime. The Dark Lord of Falkovnia does not fully understand his status as a cursed prisoner of the mists. He knows that he is somehow mystically prevented from leaving the border of his lands, which make his leadership of military campaigns unfeasible. However, he does not understand his status as a Dark Lord and this is reflected in his inability to mystically close the boundaries of his domain. But what brutal horrors are hidden in the past of this cruel warlord? How much blood and suffering mark the path of this warrior and mercenary from distant lands to the throne of Falkovnia? Rakov was born in the kingdom of Teno on the continent of Taladas in the world of green of the Dragonlance setting in the year 295 after the Cataclysm, or 665 of the Barovian Canada. Coming from humble beginnings, the records of Drakov's childhood and adolescence have been lost in the sands of time, forgotten from the annals of history. The nation of Teno rose from the ruin of the Aurian Empire, destroyed when the Cataclysm struck Taladas. Despite having a royal bloodline, Teno's true power has always been in the hands of the many nobles and landlords, and in the insidious and evil cult of Hit, one of the few clerics who maintained their access to divine power during the Age of Despair. During the time of darkness, Teno was going through turbulent times. Their nobles had always kept their soldiers ready to fight, whether against enemies from within or without. 
and the heat coat was growing in power that would soon bring the dreaded Bishop Trandamir to power for decades to come. The realm was marked by internal conflicts and only had a way to expand northwards, soon coming into war with the Minotaur League. In this dark place of green, Vlad Rakov has emerged from his humble beginnings by the strength of his sword. A skilled warrior became the leader of a band of mercenaries and gained fame and power for his daring and brutal combat tactics. Rakov was known as the Hawk, and his bands of mercenaries were colored the Talons of the Hawk. His strength and efficiency in combat earned him the blind loyalty of his men, who enriched themselves as mercenaries. Rakov believed that true victory came with complete destruction of his enemies, and rejoiced in the fear that the mere name of his mercenary company caused in his enemies. The mercenary leader did not capture enemies to demand ransom. He plundered and razed conquered territories, and made no concessions. He brutally executed his enemies through impediment, and took pleasure in watching his victims slowly die in agony while he died. Drakov's methods were efficient, but they horrified the nobles who hired him. Although the service of his mercenary company were disputed, he was seen as a barbarian by the nobility, his methods were widely condemned, and his presence considered repulsive in the courts. Drakov grew wary of this hypocrisy, and was fed up with being treated as a mere instrument for victory without ever having the respect and reverence that should have been bestowed upon him. He longed for the day when he would conquer his own lands to rule, and then demand from these nobles and landlords the respect and fear that he was due. His yearnings were heard by sinister forces. Drakov and his talons were plundering a small village they had raised leaving its dying population on the stakes, when they were surrounded by a dense fog. In the year 689, Vlad Rakov and the Talons of the Hawk emerged in the lands of the mists, in the realm of Darkon. The warrior and mercenary leader did not understand where he was or by what witchcraft or curse of the gods he had been dragged into another world. After exploring this vast kingdom, he found cities that were poorly protected and decided it was time to become a lord by force of arms. He started the looting and massacre of a small village, which quickly succumbed to the onslaught of his experienced soldiers. After pillaging the city and torturing its inhabitants for information, Vlad impaled the entire population. However, Shortly after the victims' deaths, the bodies of the dead rose to confront Rakov's forces, and soon he found himself surrounded by legions of the undead. His disciplined soldiers initially managed to repel the attack, but every member of his fallen troop rose like an undead enemy, and Vlad Rakov had to lead his forces to retreat. He fled to the border of mists, where they crossed it into the unknown. Lost in the mists, they were taken to the lands of Falkovnia, where he regrouped his men. Still dreaming of his plans for conquest, Vlad Drakov surprised the Falkovnian forces, and in a series of battles, marched to the capital Dakar, in the event called the Bloody Ride. Invading the castle, Vlad Drakov personally confronted and assassinated the wizard and king, Falcon the Great, and took the crown and throne of Falkovnia. Rakov's ascension to the Falkovnian throne also marked the end of the isolation of those lands by the mists. They did not return from the original world which they were engulfed from, but emerged south of the lands of Darkon in the year 690. Rakov had achieved his first step in his goals, and had become a leader and lord of a land, 
but his victory seemed empty without a chance to demand by force the respect and fear of the nobles of Dino. He quickly imposed a rigid and brutal government, but was met with internal resistance. In 691, the city of Silbevas was the scene of a double rebellion, when a criminal guild of thieves rose up against the rule of the military, while a plague of were rats rose from the underground sewers to confront the soldiers. After his forces experienced some defeats, and one of his talons become infected by lycanthropy, Radrakov decided to put a stop to this insurgency and personally led the campaign against these creatures. He settled with his talons in Silbervas and went on to hunt the leader of both movements, Claude Henier, a dangerous and shrewd creature who led a clan of were-rats. Many times he penetrated into the sewers and underground tunnels of Silbervas, fighting the were-rats. These dangerous disputes between Drakov and Claude Renier lasted for three years until Claude Renier let his clan's escape from Falkovnia. Drakov purged Silbervas of the were-rats, and the years from 691 to 694 became known as the ears of the impaled rats. After taking internal control of Falkovnia, Rakov installed his terror regime. His lands were divided among his most loyal soldiers, and he installed the complete dominion of his military over the oppressed population. He branded his people with hot iron, with the symbol of the hawk, stating quite obviously that he understands that his people are his property and must be at the disposal of his military. All production and trade are subject to requisitions, fees and taxes established by the government, and obtaining any service or license to exercise trades demands bribes from the military bureaucrats who control these permits. The control and domination imposed on the weak peasants was not enough to satisfy Drakov's desires. He yearned to become a leader, feared and respected by other nobles and rulers, and began training an army to conquer his neighboring kingdoms. In 695, he launched a military campaign against the kingdom of La Mordia and ordered his troops to invade the northern kingdom. His first campaign of conquest also revealed to Drakov part of his cursed condition and the great warlord was now imprisoned by the borders of his domain. The great warrior had always despised arcane magic and never understood the extent of his curse. Unable to lead the campaign, he would be deprived of the pleasure of conquest and the glories of combat, and would leave his forces orphaned by the great leader and military genius. Falkovnian troops were not prepared for this battle, however. To invade La Mordia, they needed to overcome the mountain range known as the Sleeping Beast, face the rigors of the La Mordian winter, and face soldiers better equipped with blunderbuss defending their borders. The Winter War, as it became known, ended in 696 with the retreat of Falkovnian forces. Defeat was not something Drakov was used to, especially considering that his force had been defeated by treacherous firearms, the tools of cowards. None of this disheartened Drakov from his dreams of conquest, and he believed he was destined to conquer the Grand Realm of Darkon, but the mist had first brought him in this accursed land. After four years of rebuilding his army, Vlad Drakov began a major military campaign against the Kingdom of Darkon in the year 700. He gathered his army at Stagingrad, where he revealed his plans for conquest and ordered the march and invasion through the Forest of Shadows. The first Dead Man campaign ended in tragedy for Falkovnian armies. Before conquering any outposts, hordes of the undead rose from their graveyards to confront Drakov's armies. Although the undead forces initially were repelled in combat, 
each soldier who fell rose against his comrades, and the army had to retreat. After a year of a disastrous campaign, Drakov ordered his forces to return to Falkovnia. After hard analyzing the reasons for his defeat, Drakov was convinced by his ministers that his armies needed to be better equipped for future incursions. The Minister of Finance and Trade managed to seal an important diplomatic agreement with Lamoria, and in 703, von Albeka and Drakov signed a non-aggression and trade treaty. After bolstering his army with superior weaponry from Lamoria, Drakov resumed his plan to conquer the kingdom of Darkon, and in 704 began the second incursion of the Dead Man's campaign. Once again, the undead legions proved too strong to Drakov's armies, and they had to retreat hastily. Frustrated at not being able to lead his troops, Vlad Drakov felt the bitter aftertaste of defeat and blamed his replacements for the incompetence. His fury with his soldiers was only appeased by impaling those he held responsible for the failure by their weakness and cowardice. Believing that he had purged his army of the weaklings, he reinforced his troops to launch future military campaigns. With each defeat, the conquest of Darkon became an obsession for Drakov. He needed, however, to acquire resources to replenish his armies, and casted his eyes on the rich kingdom of Borka to the south. Believing that these lands were poorly defended, and had a weak leader in Kamili Boritsi, he launched an invasion against the realm of Borka in 706. As Drakov imagined, the kingdom of Borka offered little or no military resistance, and his forces penetrated deep into the enemy territory. However, Drakov didn't count with the efficient network of spies from the Dzlizhnya family, who had known of Falkovnian plans before the attack. One of these undercover spies managed to poison the army supplies, and the campaign ended in the tragedy known as the Widow Massacre, when all the soldiers died from a potent toxin. Only one soldier returned, seized by a potent poison, to die as soon as he came into the presence of Vlad Drakov, as a form of a vivid threat to the tyrant. Frustrated, and unable to unravel the Dzlizhnya spy network, Drakov had to rethink how he would recover from yet another defeat. As if the dark powers provoked him, in 707 the lands of the Moli were unveiled by the mists in the western border of Falkovnia, and Vlad Drakov, thirsting for military conquest, ordered these new lands to be annexed to his realm. The annexation of the Molyu was a bloody campaign, and Drakov's forces managed to penetrate deep into the territory of the neighboring nation. The Falkovnian army, too numerous and better trained, were technologically backward, and faced the musket and cannons of the Molyu's forces. Despite this, reports point that the Falkovnian army appeared to be on the brink of victory when some soldiers inexplicably and abruptly surrendered and betrayed the Falkovnian forces, revealing to the Demolius armies the position of their reinforcements. This betrayal by the highest ranks of the Talons of the Hawk, who commanded the campaign, was a totally unexpected development, fruit of the powers of the still infant Dominique Donaire, who, with his speech and mental manipulation, managed to subvert the allegiance of the Falkovian forces. After this further defeat, Drakov met with his ministers to find a way to overcome the failure of this mission, to combat the supernatural influence that corrupted his men in the Demolio campaign. Vlad Drakov created the Ministry of the Arcane and commissioned his minister to combat this threat. The Minister of the Arcane's answer was to create a magical artifact to reinforce the loyalty of the soldiers. Upon being promoted to the rank of Talon, 
Soldiers undergo a promotion ceremony, where they drink a strange black liquid from a cup, whose formula is known only to Vlad Drakov. They are then given their ornate armor and helmets, as well as a pair of bracelets, which once clasped in their fists, can no longer be removed. These artifacts imbue the Talons with greater confidence and make them more cunning to sense the motivation of their enemies, but they also bewitch them to make them loyal to Drakov, making the mere thought of betrayal painful to these soldiers. Another minister who played a crucial role in Falkovnia's development was the Minister of Finance and Trade. Even with so many diplomatic disagreements, he knew how to take advantage of Falkovnia's central position for the continent commerce, trade the grain produced in the kingdom, and even establish commercial enclaves in foreign territories to expand Falkovnian influence. Countless merchants and military were sent to different kingdoms to establish trading posts and embassies, which also became a means of infiltrating soldiers and spies in neighboring kingdoms for reconnaissance purposes. During this period, Rakov wasn't only focused on his military conquests. Unable to quench his bloodlust in battles, Rakov devoted himself to his lacking other cravings and satiated his lust with countless partners. The King Führer was married twice, had numerous mistresses, kept slaves concubines, and constantly exercised the hateful prerogative of the first knight, imposing himself on newly betrothed brides. Vlad Rakov has fathered countless children, legitimate and bastards, and countless are raised in total anonymity, never discovering their true heritage. Those whom Vlad Rakov identifies as his possible sons are summoned to his presence to be recognized as Drakovs. Vlad Drakov's relationship with his children is not emotional, but they do have the opportunity to exercise their role within the Falkovnian power structure. Drakov has at least 10 known sons, who are part of his court and government structure. Two of them currently occupying the position of ministers, with Mikhail Drakov occupying the Ministry of the Arcane and Vigo Drakov occupying the position of Minister of Central Prison. Drakov believes Vigo to be one of his heirs. His son with a prisoner and slave concubine of Vistani heritage, and he is the favorite among his bastard sons. The truth is even darker. Vigo's mother is probably Isabel Adair, who remained for a long time as a slave concubine of Vlad Drakov. Vigo was born in the cells of the prison during his mother's captivity, but Vigo's real father is not Drakov, but rather a faceless gentleman who mysteriously invaded Isabel's cell, possibly the enigmatic and feared gentleman Carlos. Isabel Adair, Vigo's mother, still remained as Drakov's slave concubine after the boy's birth, until she managed to escape in 710. She escaped her torments, but carried within her another children of Drakov, and gave birth to Gabrielle Adair, who would later become the Dark Lady of Invidia and mother of the Dukar the equally tyrant and cruel Malocchio Adere. After a few years of rebuilding his army, Drakov returned to his obsession and decided once again to resume the Dead Man campaign against Darkon. The third incursion of the campaign began in 711, when a large number of soldiers invaded the lands of Darkon and once again Despite all Drakov's military planning, the Falkovnian armies were defeated by the undead hordes raised by Azani Rex. In 716, he attacked the lands of Rishmulor. The advance of their forces was repelled by the inhabitants of that realm, led by the mighty Rainier clan, the infamous Werrats, 
or had in the past been driven out of Falkovnia by Drakov. In 719, Drakov turned his attention to the lands of Gehenna, seeking to overthrow the theocracy that ruled those lands. Their invasion attempt faced the challenge of crossing the Balinok mountain range, fighting strange warped men of beastly aspects and the fanatical clerics of Zakata. Despite succeeding to invade the enemy territory, they ended up facing shortage of supplies and starvation in those desolate lands, and had to retreat. The warlord collected defeats, but was unable to recognize the pattern of his terrible curse. His reign of horror in Falkovnia was insufficient to quench Drakov's ambition and thirst for conquest, but he was cursed by the dark powers to watch from his throne the failure of his troops, deprived of the adrenaline of battle and the glory of conquest. His desire was to become a respected and feared conqueror and ruler of a vast empire, and his constant failures added to his torment and shame. After successive defeats, Drakov carried out his best planned attack on Darkov. Since the defeat in 711, Drakov became even more obsessed with defeating Azani Rex, his most hated rival, and was plotting a strategy to finally conquer the kingdom of Darkon and defeat the Undead Hordes. In 722, he launched a massive campaign against Darkon, the fourth incursion of the Dead Man campaign. Once again, all of Drakov's planning were for nothing, and his soldiers were defeated by the relentless and growing hordes of Darkon's undead. Overcome by fury, he believed it was impossible that his plan had failed, and once again blamed the leaders of his army. A new purge was made among his soldiers, impaling those considered weak and responsible for the defeat. Nothing, however, seemed to appease Drakov's desire for conquest. In 724, Drakov launched the Executioner campaign, making a surprise attack against the Monlu and Rishmulon, but found his neighbors well prepared against his advances. After the unveiling to the midst of the Kingdom of Dorvinia, a land rich in mineral resources, Drakov began to plan a new attack on these lands. Despite rumors that the ruler of those lands, Ivan de Lysnia, would be willing to become an ally of Falkovnia, Drakov had no desire for an alliance with a presumptuous fop and decided to conquer Dovinia by force. His campaign reached the capital Lichburg, and soldiers ravaged the city. The Golden Claw Massacre ended with the deaths of hundreds in the city, but before the soldiers could gather their loot, they began to fall victims of a powerful poison. Ivan de Lysnia claims to have disguised himself as a Falkovnian soldier, and amidst the enemy army he spread a poison so potent that the mere touch of the victims' bodies was fatal, and they had to be incinerated where they fell. The constant military campaigns by Vlad Drakov made their neighbors organize against this common enemy. The kingdoms of the Moli, Mordent, Ishmula, Borka, and Dorvinia signed an alliance of mutual protection against Falkovnia through the Treaty of the Four Towers. After this alliance of his southern neighbors, Drakov did not attempt further advances against these nations. Around the year 730 of the Barovian calendar, a Falkovnian commercial enclave arrived in Nvidia one of Falkovnia's many attempts to expand its area of influence and establish spies and military forces in neighboring kingdoms. This colony of Falkovnian merchants successfully established itself in the capital of the kingdom, and soon Falkovnian soldiers began to settle down and even control as a militia some districts of the city. This advanced group of Falkovnians in Nvidia managed to establish an alliance with the cruel despot Malokyo Aderi. 
through these emissaries, Rakov and Malokyo became allies, and the two rulers seemed to have developed a personal affinity and interest, unaware that they are grandfather and grandson. The Falkovnian who settled in Nvidia gained power and influence, and the dispatch of Falkovnian mercenaries to subside Malokyo's Adere genocidal plans is a matter of concern to other nations who find themselves suddenly surrounded by ruthless and conquering allies. Despite Vlad's drag of tight control, his hold on the kingdom of Falkovnia has not remained unchallenged. In the year 734, emerged from the mist Gondegal, the lost king of Arabel, a mighty warrior and military leader, accompanied by some of his most loyal men. Few know what led this conqueror and monarch from distant lands to rise up against Drakov, but his plans to lead a revolt and usurp the Falkovian throne failed. His rebellion was crushed by Drakov's forces before he had a chance to establish a solid base, but Gondegal managed to escape his enemies to the frontier of Darkon. This was not the last time Gondegal would cross Drakov's path. After some time traveling through the mists, the mighty warrior returned as the leader of an order of knights colored the circle and made it his life mission to depose the tyrannical Drakov. Gondegal now leads a rebellion movement in Falkovnia, known as the Shadow Insurgency. The Dark Powers seem willing to pit these two military conquerors against each other, and the fate of Gondegal and Drakov has yet to be fought on a battlefield. Perhaps spurred on by this revolutionary movement, another group rose up against Drakov. The Freemen of Falkovnia is a rebellious group composed of people who grew tired of Drakov's tyranny, after seeing those they love and everything they built destroyed at the hands of the soldiers. This group is quite suspicious of new members, but their numbers grow every day. Acting with guerrilla tactics, they have become a nuisance for Falkovnian military forces. While the Ministry of Intelligence and the Ministry of Central Prison try to deal with these traitors, the indiscriminate support of the Hospice of Hala for these enemies of the state has ended up earning them the enmity of Falkovnian forces, and some centers of the fate have already found retribution from the blades of Falkovnian soldiers. Despite these setbacks, the only enemy of state considered truly worth of Vlad Rakov's interest is the grandiose realm of Darkon, which Falkovnia has tried countless times to invade but has always been frustrated by the raising of the undead hordes who obey Azalin's commands. In 750, the city of Ur Aluk, capital of Darkon, was devastated in events called the Rekian, the Green Harvest, and turned into a necropolis. King Azalin disappeared from Darkon, and Drakov took advantage of this opportunity to finally advance against his great enemy and conquer his great ambition. Falkovnian forces advanced far into enemy territory and reached the city walls of the city of Nartok without facing the undead hordes. However, even without the presence of King Azalin in those lands, the dead rose in Darkon to attack Falkovnian forces, and after fixed battles, Drakov's army was once again defeated. Since 751, Drakov has not launched another military campaign. The Asian but still vigorous warlord still planned conquest and revenge against his enemies, and many fear what he will take after so many years of planning his next move. Ominous rumors points that he conspires to carry out a major campaign against the Southern Kingdoms, and his alliance and proximity to Malokyo Adair has plagued the nation's signatories of the Treaty of the Four Towers as a growing and imminent threat. 
Vigo Drakov torture us for countless hours, and we lose track of the passage of time in his underground dungeons. The long history of his father Vlad Drakov gives us horrible nightmares, escalating in horror as the promises to meet him become more frequent. Our meager knowledge revealed during torture does not satisfy Vigo Drakov, and one night we are taken exhausted and hurt to an outside country yard, where we see in horror a banquet table set in front of several wooden stakes. Chained together, we watch in horror as the soldiers salute the arrival of the King Führer Vlad Drakov, who sits down at the table. With a wave of his hands, he orders the banquet to begin. A skilled violinist starts a performance, while executioners drag us to the stakes for impalement. Inconceivable pain hit us as we are pierced by stakes. The unbearable agony becomes even more macabre at the sound of lively dinner conversation and the musical notes of a Falkovian hymn. The long-awaited death comes at a slow pace when Amidst the dark clouds of the night sky, a clear glow emerges. The moon shines on this macabre spectacle, and soon our bodies are transformed by our curse. As our bodies acquire mass, furs, and claws, we break the stakes that impale us, and feel the wolf rage consume our minds. We sense the commotion of soldiers preparing for battle, just before we lose consciousness to the beast we team. When we wake up, we are somewhere in the Falkovnian forest, covered in wounds and blood. For days, we hide from the soldiers who hunt us. And on full moon nights, we became the hunters and roam like werewolves thirsting for blood. As wolf monsters we cross Falkovnian borders, and when the full moon cycle passes, we are beyond the reach of Drakov soldiers in the lands of Rishmulah. Join us, subscribe to this channel and activate notifications, and together we will resume our journey far from the horrors of the lands of Falkovnia, as we explore the lands of Rishmulah in the search of a sage who can help us heal the curse of lycanthropy. But before that, Let's first take a closer look into Vladeska Drakov and Falkovnia from the Von Richten Guide to Ravenloft in the 5th edition of Dungeons & Dragons.